السلام عليكم جميعا ومرحبا في الكهف الاسود هالمره الكهف الاسود في الكهف الاسود القديم اللي تحول ميلس في بيتنا آه ان شاء الله اليوم بيكون البودكاست مالنا كله عن الفيرتيليتي عن الانجاب موضوع مهم جدا في عالم بودي بيلدينج الكل يبغى يعرف آه والكل اصلا من يدخل عالم بودي بيلدينج يقول لك ما بتيب عيال نبغى نعرف انه هل فعليا ما بتيب عيال ولا الموضوع آه لا في في وايد تحت هذا تحت هذه الجمله يعني فان شاء الله اليوم جايبين لكم رجل يعني جينيس في هذا الموضوع آه هذا الشخص نحن بغينا نيب بغينا نيب الامارات لكن ريال وايد بيتوتي وايد يحب يجلس ويا هلا يعني تبك الامريكي آه وش اسمه فالحين ان شاء الله آه بنعرفكم عليه اسمه اليكس كيكل كيكل, كيكل. واليكس ان شاء الله بيتكلم عن فيرتيتي مع الدكتور انا حاليا ما اعتبر اكسبرت في هذا الموضوع آه هم الاثنين بيدخلون ديب في الموضوع وانا مجرد مستمع First of all, hi Alex. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for having you, uh, for uh, letting us do this podcast with you. Here in the in the Middle East, the the topic of fertility is is just uh, some people call it like it's overrated, and some people say it's just uh, like normal. But but due to the demand that we are getting about fertility and due to the you know uh, the people talk about if you enter bodybuilding, you really get uh, trouble having birth and stuff, stuff uh, bringing uh, a child or something else so so that's why we're, we're getting you into it because uh, we've heard a lot about you but you can go ahead and speak about yourself even if it's like i know i know it's, uh, you guys don't like speaking about yourself but just give us a 30 second one minute uh, brief about about who's alex definitely so um i am someone who lives his dream every single day got a beautiful wife three kids three puppies i work with bodybuilders of every single level both genders every category um, physique competitors, obviously, strength athletes, dysfunctional people, pretty much everything. I've termed myself, it's no longer like a prep coach, even though that's the name of my business. It's really just fixing biology. So if you have a biological problem, I fix it. This conversation is more the fertility side of things. So I released a fertility ebook uh, sometime last year. And just from that ebook alone, I had, I think it's up to like 450 or 500 successful pregnancies from that alone. On top of working with people specifically when they have some issue like some guy um just had like a white blood cell spermatic based issue so pyrospermia and tons of different things like that on the male and female side of things so i have fallen into this role of working with every single kind of person whether they're athletes dysfunctional gen pop everything and it's so much fun so i just live my dream every single day i can't believe i get paid to talk about this stuff i love coming on talking with people about this kind of stuff and that's me in a nutshell i'm just one happy guy I appreciate it, brother. Appreciate, appreciate it. it, Alex. So regarding the book for Alex Keiko, well, Alex Keiko, I mean, this is a book. I got it already, read it so many times, discussed it with Alex and the Instagram. And we're going to talk about it maybe just a little bit in depth. Just uh, first of all, Alex just introduced himself. I'm a doctor as well. And my name is Dr. Khaled. I'm a family physician interested in bodybuilding. And to be honest, I think the moment we started, the, I mean, I mean, just to, just I would just want to emphasize on something is that uh, when Broderick Chavez was here and also when John was here, probably the most, I mean, they received a lot of questions regarding fertility. And I remember Dr. Broderick Chavez said, people here, they do ask a lot about PCT and fertility. They do ask a lot about it. And maybe you can ask Abdullah, since Abdullah, he's been into bodybuilding before me. Some, a lot of the clients, they do ask about PCT and am I, going to be fertile after using, for example, a PED. So that's their main, con main concern. We know that, I mean, PED could affect your brain, heart, liver, but people, especially in this area, they do care about the brain, liver, and kidney, and all that stuff, but fertility comes probably first, Abdullah. It comes even before, uh, before, before anything, CBC. <laughs> yeah. Before anything. Yeah. Am I going to be infertile the moment I use PED or not? So that's why, I mean, <laughs> It's a, it's a big topic here. It is a big the, topic. Yeah. The thing is, the thing is, I mean, um, maybe you want to talk about it a little bit more from the basics. Like, for example, I just want to say um, the moment. Uh, I mean, the the thyroid. I mean, the system, the endocrine system for our body, starting from the GnRH, LH, FSH, so we can understand what happens in case you're starting using a PED and how to solve it. Definitely, yeah. So before we even start with there, we'll say the sake of this conversation is for males. Females is a whole different category. They're right. a lot harder to fix. So in that actual ebook, I tried to avoid the medication 
like the Clomids, like the Letrozoles, even though they have their place, because I see those causing more problems than good, they have their place, but that's for the, for the dysfunctional female. So this right. conversation's mainly male fertility because there's a big difference there. So bare bones basics. Let's make this as easy as, as possible because you read it in a textbook and you're like the hypothalamus anterior pituitary. Why do I have to know about that? So we have these two areas. So hypothalamus, we can basically break it up into the preoptic nucleus and the arcuate nucleus. All we have to know is that those downstream cause interactions at the anterior pituitary drive gonadotropin release and hormone. From there, downstream again, we have all the stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. At that point, those hormones essentially go down and drive what's called spermatogenesis. So the creation, the genesis of all these sperm cells goes through four different phases, starting off with the Golgi, goes into the cat formation, goes into the formation of the tail, and the ultimate maturation. If we pull back the lens on spermatogenesis as a whole, and it's important to understand this for the drugs we're about to talk about, we see it going from a spermatogonia into a primary spermatocyte, into a secondary spermatocyte, into a spermatid, and then finally a spermatozoa. That spermatozoa is what we ejaculate into the female vagina, into that canal, goes to the fallopian tubes, and then actually matures the oocyte. So like we said with females, they're so much harder because all we have to do as guys is get a functional sperm into an egg and fertilize it. That's all we do as guys. So that's an easy problem to fix. Females, though, they go from the oogonium through all the different th follicular phases to an actual tertiary follicle. They have to move that tertiary follicle, pull the cell out of it, move it into the actual fallopian tube, get it to fertilize, and then they have to manufacture this human being. That's hard. Like, that's a lot of biological work. But right. for guys, the, the question of fertility is very much easier to fix than with females. So on the enhanced side, like you said, now we kind of have, like, the basics understood. Um, it, the, the first question is usually... If I take a, a PED, a TRT, blast, cruise, whatever, am I going to lose my fertility? Temporarily, maybe, but long-term, no. So right. fertility is like a light switch. We can turn it on and we can turn it off pretty much whenever we want. Unless if you have some kind of a genetic issue, like we kind of alluded to with the white blood cells in the beginning or <laughs> environmental problems, that's maybe 5 or 10% of people. And even at that, it's very fixable. The only men that usually aren't fixable on the fertility side of things have sodium potassium pump issues in the sperm themselves. But again, that's the 1% of people who they just will never be able to conceive a child. That happens. That sucks. If you figure out how to fix that, that's the billion dollar way to break into the medical industry. But again, we can't know that. I have some ideas, but I'm obviously never going to figure it out. I don't have the resources. So we understand that. Understand that most people can fix their fertility. It's as simple as understanding what we just talked about in the beginning. If we take exogenous testosterone or really any injury, over time, it's going to shut down that hypothalamic anterior pituitary cascade that shuts down the stimulating and luteinizing hormone cascade. What does that stop? All intratesticular actions and all spermatogenic actions. And it blunts it more than stops it. How many people have been on TRT or blasting and still get their wife pregnant or their partner pregnant? Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Not common, but maybe 20% of people. For the other 80% or so of people, it's as simple as bringing in a fertility protocol to drive up acute fertility, get your wife pregnant 30, 90 days, and then come back off. Now, that's the primary that I like to do it just because it's so simple. It's 30 to 90 great days of increasing fertility and then coming off so you don't have to stay on things year long. At the same time, though, there's a lot of people that will have ATG in the background so that they don't lose fertility. And although they're not going to lose it, if they want to keep their natural production on, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's a need for it for fertility purposes, but it's definitely a certain way to go. So with that being said, well, I'll kind of stop talking and we'll kind of go back and forth. 100%. Yeah. So, I've, seen, I've seen people implement HCG, calling it, I don't know, on-cycle therapy or on something? On-cycle therapy, something yeah. like that, it's, right? Uh, as you said, it's not, it's not necessary, yeah? Yeah, exactly. It's not necessary unless if you want to keep the testicular atrophy from, from occurring. So if your partner says, hey, I don't like your testicles when they're that small, I want them bigger and plump, you're keeping HCG in. If your partner doesn't care, you don't care, then it doesn't matter. But the fertility side of it is that's proximal. I see. From a, from a bodybuilder perspective, I, I really don't care how big my balls are. I care about my, my gains, yeah. Will, will having an OCT, uh, like an ACG deployed in my, within my cycle, would that affect on my uh, uh, anabolics to work? So you can make an argument because there is a pretty cool estrogenic driver from ACG. So estrogen itself is really cool. Too much is a problem, too little is a problem. We want to find that sweet spot, which is different for everyone. I've taken mine up to like 500 picograms per milliliter. Other people may be at 
40, 80, 100, like it really depends on the person. We want as high as we can handle without getting negative side effects. Right. It improves insulin yeah. sensitivity, glycogen storage, the entire IGF reservoir peptide cascade, the androgenic, like you just go down and estrogen, good, it's not bad, but if you have too much for you, you get the edema, you get the moon face, you get blood sugar dysfunction. So we don't want too much, but we don't want nothing. So some people could use that as like a weak estrogenic driver in the background if they need extra estrogen and they don't want to get it from more testosterone or other things. So it's not that it's bad, but it's more, do you need the extra estrogen from it? Oh, the thing is, Alex, I want to differentiate between two things. People get confused about two things, PCT and fertility. Because in my opinion, I think they're very late related, but in the same time, they're a little bit different than each other, right? Because if you're looking at the PCT, our main goal is to restore your LH and at the same time to restore your testosterone. But in the case of fertility protocol, in this case, we need both LH and FSH. The reason why, because LH is going to work on your Sertoli cell, sorry, on your lytic cell to produce testosterone. Mm -hmm. And then FSH is going to work on your Sertoli cell for the spermatogenesis. So that's why, what's your opinion on that? Like a PCT versus fertility protocol? Thousand percent correct. So if we look at how these sperm cells are maturing and you look at the uh, hormonal cascades in between. So again, we go back to what we said before where we have the spermatogonia, which is the primary, then going to the actual uh, primary spermatocyte, then secondary, everything goes up all the way to a spermatozoa. In between each of those is a cascade of LH and FSH. It's right. the same with females going from an oocyte all the way to an actual tertiary follicle, or you need both LH and FSH to drive that process. At the same time, though, like you said, PCT is not worried about fertility, which is more the LH cascade. So think LH, luteinizing hormone, testosterone, think FSH, follicle stimulating, more spermatogenesis. Oh, fertility yeah. needs a little bit of both, but PCT is exactly like you said. Yeah, so they are completely different goals. And if we're looking at just making it as simple as possible, if someone's trying to PCT, think mainly HCG, whereas if you're mm -hmm. trying to use for fertility, think more HCG and HMG. HMG. Oh, okay. Okay. So want to talk about PCT first, because that's a big thing here. And then maybe we can talk about a little bit of fertility. Yeah. Maybe. But just, just the thing is, I mean, I've been, I've been doing my research and uh, to be honest, a lot of my information just in quotation from Victor Black, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and, <laughs> Okay. I, I don't follow drama or anything, so I don't know if there was drama there, but sorry if there was. <laughs> There's no drama here at all. We don't have any drama with anybody. It's a very good source of information, to be honest. I mean, the thing is, um, there's a lot of people, the moment that you stop taking your PEDs, regardless of your type of uh, ester, they start doing a PCD, which we know it's wrong because you need none of the PEDs amount to be in your system before starting any sort of PCT. Now, the thing is, if you want to, let's say, start a PCT, I want to ask you two things, Alex. First of all, let's say a first-time user and somebody who's a little bit more advanced. Most of the time, the first-time users, they do come back normally, like after, let's say, like six, seven, eight weeks, maybe. It differs from person to person. So in my opinion, it's good to do a blood test like five, six weeks after stopping a PED because you might rebound back, right? But in the case of an advanced one, in this case, what is his chance of rebounding back Man, without doing a PCT? A, yeah, that's such a great question, such a hard one to answer, because I have had people take one, one shot of testosterone, they're shut down forever, and other people, I have to be pros that blast and cruise for two decades, three decades, come off and they recover fine. Wow. So I really don't have an answer for that. You know, the entire PCT conversation is maybe, maybe if you're thinking that, maybe you should be the person who keeps HCG in the background so that interest has to your actions are just always kind of going. Mm -hmm. If you're that concerned about keeping your natural production going, the things like your shilajit, um, your tongue gut, all these, those things aren't going to be as effective when you're taking exogenous testosterone. Once you're off, maybe you bring those in to bring things more back from like a herbal over the counter side of things. But if you're kind of on TRT or blasting, you want to go back to PCT, maybe you just keep ATG in the entire time so you don't even have to turn off temporary production. It's just a little bit blunted. That's always a very viable way. And with PCTs, everyone likes to always say there's this best protocol out there. There's this perfect way to do it. In reality, there's probably like a dozen. There's probably a dozen, dozen different proper ways to do PCT. It's more based on what you really want to do. Do you want to take ATG 
Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, 100 IUs, what 1,000 IUs, whatever people need, or do you want to wait and restore that afterwards? So there really is no uh, right or wrong answer to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. Uh, Actually, there's no optimal optimal thing in bodybuilding and in general so but but <laughs> i want you to give me just 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 a, a broad protocol of how can you design a, a pct if, if let's say you you got like 100 of, of of cases and then probably you'll have like around 40 percent which are quite the same which is the general population how would you how would you design how would you design that pct Yep, definitely. So like you said, there's no right or wrong answer, but we try and give guidelines because if I just say it depends, who cares? No one's going to get any education. Out exactly. Of that. Yeah. So the guidelines for me is if I'm talking with someone, whether they're novice, intermediate, advanced, and they say, hey, I don't want to ever lose my natural production. I want to PCT afterwards. That's the person. We have a low dose therapy and HCG in the background throughout the entire time. So we never lose that actual natural endogenous production. Then once we come off and drop the exogenous testosterone, then something like 500 milligrams of like Tunga Dali to cover more of the testosterone cascade, maybe like 200 to 400 milligrams of Sustanch to cover more IGF and estrogen cascades. That's where those comes in because then you're trying to optimize natural production that you're also getting stimulation from with the HCG. So that's generally what I do if someone wants to PCT. It's not turning it off in the first place. I see. Okay. Let's say you stop, like, let's say somebody's using like enanthate, which is probably a moderate moderate ester, I would say. So you wait like five, six weeks, and then you measure his blood, uh, you measure his uh, hormones, let's say, testosterone, LH, FSH, and you found all of them are downgraded. In this case, you need a PCT. And let's say this guy, this particular guy, he doesn't want to go back on using PED. So I think probably that case, we can think about PCT. Correct. Yep, that's 1,000% oh, right. That's the only oh, time. I see. That's so, the only time you so can PCT, think about PCT. PCT is, 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 is in other words, is... is uh, it's either babies or bodybuilding. I, I would say there's no going back. As yeah, there's no go. I don't think so. I mean, if you're, I mean, I've been reading, I've been reading a little bit of some some of the podcasts as well. Um, the problem is if doing blast and then not going back to TRT, doing a PCT, that affects your body in a different way. Your body is used to that number of that level of testosterone. I mean, your liver is used to that number of glucose some testosterone would help with that and all probably all your metabolic mechanism in your body is used to that number of testosterone the moment you stop everything it's a bad moment for your body because everything goes down with it right so going back on a trt is a smart way unless you want to stop everything in this case probably you want to do a pct what do you think about that alex i I love that because my whole rationale with people is usually if you are going to partake in taking performance enhancing drugs, I think you should be on them for life. That right. doesn't mean you're always going to be blind. You're taking growth hormone, insulin, growth hormone, you know, all that metformin, whatever. But it also means you're always going to be on some form of HRT, whether it's just TRT or a low dose of whatever else you want. To me, it's once you start, you kind of, you know, signing yourself up for the rest of your life. You don't have to do it that way. But if we, like you said, compare the difference between being natural and having a high amount of testosterone or TRT, the differences are basically nothing because we're keeping levels at the same level. It's just we're getting it from a bottle. So some down regulation on the cholesterol panel, but we can fix that. There's so many over-the-counter supplements that can fix that. There's so many drugs that can come to fix that. There's the lifestyle interventions. There's the photonic exchange from the sun that can fix that. So to me, the difference between PRT and natural in terms of a health aspect is very minimal. And then you also have the TRT, like you said, proving your point, improving your quality of life and better quality of life, more active more sexually active, the actual act of orgasming with a partner, so not actual masturbation by yourself, but orgasming with your partner has so many different neurochemical benefits as well. You're doing that because you have a robust libido. You have the enhanced acetylcholine recycling of the spine from the TRT. Like it just improves your life. You're moving more, you're having more sex, you're more vibrant, you're more rigorous, your life is better. So you can always make that argument that that's probably gonna improve your life. Like I think that's gonna add to versus the person who is on RT or low on testosterone rather they're sitting around the house their libido's low they can't have sex they can't exercise because they have no energy like i completely agree with you on that right so uh, uh alex you want to talk about about let's say just an example let's say somebody who's like 30 years old or let's say 35 years old he's been said by his doctor that you can't use any more ped and he's convinced by his doctor he's the one who use a ped last shot was like five weeks ago you want to start a pcd with him 
What an example of a protocol you want to use, assuming that his test is low, LH is low, FSH, FSH is low. So you're having it handy, HCG, uh, tamoxifen, and uh, clomiphene citrate. What would be your assumption protocol, I would say? Yeah, super simple, because everyone loves to manage estrogen. Estrogen is so good for us in the right range. So right. instead of starting off someone with a couple thousand IU of HCG every couple times per week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever dosing schedule you want to do, why not start off with a couple hundred IUs of HCG, not uh, generate enough downstream estrogen so you don't have to manage it? So instead of taking the highest amount of HCG, why not begin lower and allow your body to figure out where that estrogen range is at? So let's say with a normal person, like you said, that example, I'd probably start him off with three to 500 IUs of HCG, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, subcutaneous before bed. And that's generally enough robust response on the testosterone axis and everything else we talked about, and not so much pressure on estrogen that they don't have to manage it. So to me, that's kind of the best case scenario because you don't have to manage estrogen versus taking too much HCG than having to manage the estrogen. Right. That sounds good. So you would continue with that? You wouldn't increase the dose of HCG, let's say, Alex? Only as needed. So if we're getting his testosterone up to say maybe five, six hundred nanograms per deciliter, he must be like nine hundred. Then maybe we tick it up an extra hundred or two hundred IU's, and just every couple of weeks you recheck. You see, and in this environment, you can go really based off of biofeedback, and then get the blood work. So once you hit that range of he says, my joints feel amazing. I have all the energy in the world. I have mental clarity. I want to basically have sex all day. Like once you hear all those biofeedback markers. We get the blood work done. We say, oh, your testosterone is at 900 nanograms per deciliter at this dosage. So we keep you there. But until you get those biofeedback markers, you keep working up the dosage of HCG because everyone metabolizes it so differently. I've had a couple of people who are just terrible drug dismantlers and metabolizers where they had to take 2,000 IUs of HCG Monday, Wednesday, Friday to get a testosterone of like 400. They just dismantled them so poorly. They just didn't, you know, have the genetics and enzymatic capacity to break them down well enough. So other people could be at a couple, you know, 500 IUs and have a testosterone of 900. So it does depend on the person. But like we said, start low, work up. Once you see the feedback markers, hold HCG there, see where your testosterone levels are at. And then, you know, hey, you know, the thousand IUs of HCG Monday, Wednesday, Friday puts me at 900 milligrams per deciliter. I'm good to go. Okay. And you would never use like Nolvarex or let's say tamoxifen and clomiphene, right? Um, I would if they're needed. So again, there's no good or bad drug out there. But we're all just trying to take the least amount of drugs possible to get the most amount of the result. Because at the end of the day, when we metabolize these drugs, it all accumulates systemic fatigue. So we have fatigue of training, of life, of eating the food we do, of stress from work. Like all this stuff accumulates. The more polypharmacy we get involved in, the more that sucks up and accumulating fatigue. That's not a bad thing. Everyone has different amounts of fatigue they can handle. But in this environment, we try and want to get the most out of the least possible. Now, the least possible could be a pretty high dose for some people, it could also be pretty low for others. So if you would need maybe to stop the binding of estrogen at the breast tissue specifically for a guy, Novadex comes in and then you also lower HCG so you bring down total estrogen levels. If maybe you want to just trial and not use HCG, but use the Clomid instead to generate some testosterone, you could also do that. There's a lot of different ways you can go about, but I usually like HCG alone as a standalone because it's just so effective and efficient. A lot of people now, um, I believe HCG is now not FDA prescribable in the US, or they did something weird with a couple of these uh, facilities and now it's only going to add a relic. So gonadarelin is an awesome secondary option, still works in similar mechanisms than cascades, but you're looking at a lower dosage. Okay. I see. So the thing is, I mean, what about the idea that on Nolvadex and let's say tamoxifen and clomiphene would stimulate, I mean, it fools your brain, it has a low estrogen because it binds, because it's a serum, right? So in this case, it affects your brain by producing more FSH and LH. What do you think about that? Jet, so it's not a bad thing, but I would rather go with the HCG because we have the direct action versus the indirect, exactly like you said. I see. Right. If someone's like me, Alex, and I'm I'm, I'm scared of losing my game. I see. I, I I'm in a scenario where I wanna I wanna get my wife pregnant, and uh, at the same time, I wanna I'm I'm sure I'm not gonna keep all my gains, but at least I'm gonna keep some. In that case, how would you how would you control some anabolic windows when it comes to to a, to a specific, specific oh, case gonna, like mine, you're, yeah. You're going to love this answer. Um, you keep your androgens and your PDs the same, and all you do is add in the fertility protocol. They can right. be thought oh. as independent pathways because we are stimulating direct spermatogenesis 
and, and direct intratesticular actions. So whether your blaster cruising over here, high amount of growth hormone, high amount of whatever, that does not matter. The high amount of androgens does not matter. Think of them as two separate cascades and fertility can be turned on or off regardless. So in my fertility ebook, it's HCG, HMG, and carnitine. Carnitine is awesome because some people can run into some motility, morphology-based problems. So basically the sperm can, they don't actually look like triangles or squares, but they can be misshapen. That screws up velocity. It screws up a lot of things like that. Carnitine Glum. helps to improve those cascades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Glum. I've read your book many times, so I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So again, yeah, if you have those three things, though, it covers, HCG covers the intratesticular actions. HMG yeah. covers these hematogenic actions and carnitine basically covers all your other bases. And carnitine can also be used by females to do the same thing for their eggs. Females can use a bunch of other things out there to induce ovulation and their development. So there's a lot of cool fertility drugs on both sides. It's just less risk for guys because once you create a sperm, so all you, all the guys out there, you can have the most, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, um, <laughs> the most retarded broken sperm. He could be one-legged, hobbling along, but as long as he gets that egg and <laughs> fertilize it, it has no negative impact on the fetus. So right. he's not going to have birth defects or things like that. That sperm could be the weakest of the weakest, but he was strong enough to get that egg. Whereas for the female, if she adds in some other drugs to help fertility, she not only has the egg fertilized it, but then she's putting together the organogenesis that ensues to produce the liver and the kidneys and the brain and the spinal cord, and they can run into issues during the manufacturing of the child. So that's why for girls, the one product I really like is nicotinamide mononucleotide, so NMN, that and carnitine. So we can drive a lot more of filter development. We can actually not really induce ovulation, but drive that entire oogonium through all the way down to the tertiary um, actual follicle and produce the HMD. But for females, it's kind of the least amount possible. And for guys, it's usually, you know, more fertility drugs is only going to help you. But generally, HCG, HCG, carnitine, you're good to go. Right. I'm going to squeeze you more, Alex, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, go crazy. <laughs> go crazy, sure. So Alex, I've read your protocol. So we talk about the PCT, we start like 500, right? But in your protocol, HCG, we started by 1,000. Yep. So any rationale? I mean, why we start on that 500 and why we start here? And we know from the, from the studies, 500 probably it's enough to... I mean, some of the studies show that 500 is enough probably to stimulate your lighting cells, right? Oh yeah, yeah, most definitely. So it goes back to what we said earlier, actually, PCT versus fertility, two different things. With right. that protocol specifically, I wanted it to be made so people had a 30 to 90 day window to get their wife pregnant. Because with this protocol, we're trying to essentially get fertile and then get back to normal because we're taking three extra drugs, sometimes just to guard up quarantine in the background. But I would rather start off with a big bang, get someone pregnant quicker versus having to wait for five, six months. Because as you go throughout this process, what everyone has to take into consideration is the psychology. It gets hard. Whenever you're trying to have a kid and you're months in and it's just not happening, it wears on you. You really have to plan it out. So the more chances you have to be intimate, to actually ejaculate, to get that sperm into the vaginal canal, the better. It really is a game of chances. So anytime like we're planning to have a kid, we schedule, we periodize it just like training. We do morning and night every day, no matter what, because that's two chances per day to fertilize an egg. Now with my daughter, now three and a half, um, we didn't use anything. I believe I had a higher dose of androgens at that time, no fertility protocol. We were trying for probably like eight months. Like it was just kind of like casually trying, you know, but still you're like seven months in, you're like, Man, this is this is getting tough. Like, do I have to do something about it? Then we got pregnant. Then for my last two boys, we brought in a fertility protocol and we were pregnant within, I think, with my second, well, with my uh, first son, Aiden, who's one and a half now. That was like 60-ish, 70 days. Whereas with Apollo, my newest son, that was like 20 days. Like, it was really cool. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So. The quality of the people into it as well. That's awesome. You know what, Alex? I think probably HMG changed a lot, right? Oh, it, it makes all the difference. It, it, do, it does, yeah. The activity itself. I've seen certain people gain five to 10 million per sperm within one week, which is crazy. Most people can develop about a million new sperm per day, but these guys were getting like 10 million sperm per week, which is really pretty crazy. So onwards, upwards of 15. So HMG comes in as a big player there. You can get away with just HCG, but again, protracted period. How long do you really want to be trying for? Right. The thing is, I want to just mention one thing. Um, I mean, HCG, it mimics LH. It's not an LH. It mimics the LH. It probably does stimulate your, 
your testicle to produce testosterone just like an LH. But HMG does both. Here comes my second question. HMG has both LH and FSH. LH is responsible for your intertesticular testosterone and FSH is responsible for spermatogenesis. Now, the thing is, if HMG has both, why do I need HCG, Alex? Mm, Doesn't cause the same maturation of the sperm cell to the same extent. So okay. if you can imagine your factory, your testicles, whatever, we're looking at putting together these sperm from the spermatogonia all the way to the spermatozoa, that entire process we've talked about a couple of times now, imagine having three factory workers putting those together and assembling them versus having a thousand factory workers to put them together and assemble them. It's essentially that so you have to turn up the hub of your intertesticular cascades as a whole because spermatogenesis is not just directed by FSH and LH. It's dependent upon so many other biological cascades. So we have to upregulate the entire environment. It's almost like when you take healing peptides, BPC-157 and TB-500, they work awesome by themselves, right? How do they work even better? With a little bit of growth hormone and insulin in the background because you need that pressure on somatic and insulogenic cascades. Right. So it's about managing the pressure on that access specifically. Yes. You can probably get away with just HMG, but again, probably takes longer and then who wants to wait that? And HMG is not cheap drug, right? Oh, it's expensive. Yeah, it's an expensive one. That's it. why. How much is it here? I don't know, but they sell it. Yeah, okay. They do sell it. So, um, Alex, uh, I mean, in your protocol, it says eight weeks, which is like almost two months. So, like, 60 days. what do you do after that? Do you increase the doses or you stay with the same dose of the eighth week? So, generally, once they get to the eighth week, eighth, ninth week, there's usually a positive pregnancy. If there's not, you jack things up, but you only increase the carnitine and the HCG. I stopped there because I didn't want people to have a window of use this fertility protocol for six months. Like I've had certain people run that protocol for six months and then they reach out to me and I'm like, oh no, there's a deeper problem here going on. We have to fix that. But again, that's the coaching side of things because it, it's so specific with fertility. But generally eight or nine weeks is more than enough. If you get to that point and there's still a problem, having more HMG generally doesn't turn up that spermatic uh, dial enough. So it's 75 IU vials or what is it? 120, 125? Whatever, 120, 125, whatever the other vials are, the difference in spermatogenic activity is like a couple thousand extra sperm. So it does not, there's that bell curve response where 75 gets you up here, and then 125 is kind of like barely better, sometimes bringing you down a little bit, actually. So with HMG, we're looking at generally 75 IUs three times per week, and then HMG can be turned up a little bit higher. So it's not a problem with spermatogenic uh, pressure. It's what we talked about before with the factory itself. So the HCG can be worked up a thousand I use, you know, three times a week, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. It depends on how you're responding to it. Because remember, there's right. still an estrogenic component and an insulin sensitivity component to be able to get some. Uh, right. So what's the L-carnitin dose? Uh, L-carnitin is 500. I think you're doing right. Yeah, at a baseline. And even if you're taking like 200, 250 in the background, that's still doing a lot of positive action. But if you really want to make sure you're kind of bulletproofing your sperm, 500 milligrams, like a gram, seems to be the sweet spot for most people. But not reducing, gram, uh, so sorry, Alex, not reducing your, your androgens, wouldn't that help? And like, I, I see them totally different. Like this is a, a whole uh, separate system than the other. Yes, so it's, a, it's not a separate system. It's the fact that you're turning on a system that was turned off through pharmacological means. So because you're taking these exogenous drugs, you can't stop their action. So if you're taking exogenous testosterone to shut it down, you're taking something else to uh, turn it back on. So th although the cascades are the same, you're turning it on pharmacologically. So instead of having one light switch, you now have two and they're both turned up. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. okay. I got it. Yeah. So again, Alex. Metaphor, so I hope they're working. Yeah. <laughs> Those things makes me understand because uh, I'm the only guy who's not into biology. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Alex, I'm going to squeeze you on this part. So let's say like eighth week, then do you increase your HCG doses to 5,000, for example? Like in the ninth, 10th, 11th week? Yeah, most definitely. You go higher than HCG, right? You can definitely go upwards of usually eight or 9,000. That's a big dosage of HCG, but that's kind of the top out point where I've seen some people that I don't want to say they weren't meant to have children, but they are natural guys who just literally can't even get their wives pregnant right. naturally. So we're trying to fix that access. So HCG can be anywhere from 500 I use all the way up to 9,000 three times per week. Usually though, you're talking about it like five or 6,000 for most people three times a week. Right. And what about the HMG? You, you keep it the same or you go up like 150 in this case? 
75 I use stays linear throughout because even at the 120, 125, or 150, we just don't see the changes on that spermatic cascade that we would want. Now, again, there is a change. I don't want that to be misunderstood, but we're talking about instead of going up by an extra million sperm count per day, that genesis process, we're looking at a couple thousand, which although it only takes one, it's just such a big it's a low return on your investment for as expensive as HMG is. Right. Usually we're not trying to make people break the bank. So it's not going to hurt you taking more. It's just generally not needed. So I don't know, just, uh, yeah, just I get ugly. Uh, let's pity him. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if, if I, if I followed this protocol of, uh, just turning the factory on with, with that, with pharmacologically and then, W- wouldn't that mean that I have a bigger chance because there is more sperm cell? Wouldn't that mean that I have a bigger chance of getting like twins or triplets? I think so, right, Alex? What's that? I didn't catch that. Is, isn't uh, by 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 implementing this uh, uh, this uh, protocol of uh, fertility with those high amounts of sperm cells that are uh, turning on? Wouldn't that uh, give us a bigger chance of getting like uh, twins or triplets? No because we're no? looking at sperm versus egg. So the females are the one that controls the eggs. You're yeah. looking at fertilizing multiple eggs. So it's in the female body, not the male body that can generate the actual. That's why a lot of people say, uh, what is it, clomid? They'll say females stay away from clomid because it can drive that for their development of that tertiary follicle. And that can cause multiple eggs to get fertilized at the same time. I haven't actually seen that play out, to be honest. In the hundreds of pregnancies I've seen, we're not seeing tons of twins or triplets even with clomid therapy in females but yeah that's a that's an egg female based phenomenon not a male okay okay so alex i mean the thing is when we do a semen analysis i mean that's the number one thing we have to do for someone right a semen analysis doing the test doing all the labs and then then doing a semen analysis and then after that because just there is a misconception actually people think that having a high volume means that you can conceive and they keep forgetting about morphology concentration and motility, they do play a big role. I think this is where L-carnitine cam- c- comes in handy, right? Most definitely, yes. Yeah. So if we go down that route of the conversation, there is L-carnitine, there's soy lecithin, and there's pigeon. So I use soy lecithin and pigeon with a lot of my male adult actors in order to produce you know, greater seminal volume. What, what's that, uh, Alex? L-carnitine and what else? What's it? Soy lecithin and pigeon. They're over-the-counter supplements. Okay. So if we look at those, generally, if we're looking at like a adult, you know, male actor scene, where there's maybe, I'm trying not to be vulgar here, but there's a massive ejaculatory load being shot at the end that has to be there for the camera's sake, we're looking at increasing that seminal volume, which increases sperm density. So the soy lecithin increases sperm density, and the pigeon actually releases more prostate gland fluid. So you get the pre-cum that's actually released of prostate gland fluid. That prostate gland fluid has the most amount of sperm. So hence why people say, oh, you know, um, pulling out is not the most effective method of birth control because right. it's not that pre-cum, that prostate fluid still has a ton of sperm in them. So within, uh, before we get to the vast deference, which is the portion that kind of shoots that ejaculatory load out, which is load being the actual semen, amino acids, ton of stuff, different cool things in there. It's starting off with prostate fluid. It's being, then being combined with seminal vesicle fluid. There's a portion called clumping, which sounds pretty gross, but it's combining the two. Vast deference comes in, pumps it out, and that's what we actually ejaculate from our penis. Um, Alex, just before we end up, I'm trying to excuse you as much as possible. So the thing is, some of them, they do ask a lot. I mean, um, is it smart to do semen analysis before starting androgen? Because we don't want to blame androgen. Yeah. 1000%. Get your sperm, uh, your uh, semen analysis and see overall motility, viscosity, volume. Um, if we can see a couple different other players like the morphology, that's all going to be good total count. If you have a count of like 20 to 40 million, you're not doing that bad. Generally, we're looking at getting pregnant around that 30 to 40 million plus range. You can get pregnant on lower amounts, but that's a really robust range to have a lot of sperm and more chances to fertilize an egg. So yeah, see what's going on beforehand. And then if you're blasting or cruising, check again. You may not be at zero. Like for me and for a lot of people though, if you are on TRT or higher, you're pretty much at like a zero. You got like four sperm. Like you don't got much going on in there. You can still get pregnant, but a lot of (laughs) things aren't going the way you want to. But if they are, if you are blasting or cruising or whatever, and you get this semen analysis and motility is fine, morphology is fine, there's no kind of uh, pyspermia going on or no white blood cell problem, then, you know, you're probably much good to go. You maybe not even need a fertility protocol. 
So, um, Alex, what about Proviron and a PCT or fertility protocol? Let's a low dose, let's say 25 milligram. I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, I think it's suppressive by 100, but 25 milligram, it will increase your free test in this case, right? What yeah, so it, it's funny though. So with Proviron, I see that as being more of the desire libido-based player than anything else. Right. Yeah. So going back to work with male adult actors, you bring that in the in there so that their libido is high. They want to constantly have sex. That yeah. indirectly improves the factory period as long as prolactin's not too high. And yeah, that's most definitely a valid thing to add in. Um, you could also go down if there is hyperprolactinemia, um, either P5P, so vitamin B6, more if it's more of a bigger problem like a caber going to manage that prolactin because that can screw up the actual morphology and density of the sperm if there is like you have an obese person even if he's an athlete taking the androgens and he's fatter there's a poor amount of insulin insensitivity there's a lot of right. insulin insensitivity that's where metformin comes in to improve the density of the sperm and the morphology from you being fat overweight and not insulin sensitive you, it turned out to be. Uh, we need I, another podcast. I, I feel I, f I feel relieved to be honest. <laughs> I feel good after this podcast. I felt it's gonna be like because I I heard a lot about the more you shut down the factory, the the longer it's gonna take to switch back on again. But when you said thirty to ninety days, you're just making it easier for us to keep the gains because gains for me is like you really you had like very important. <laughs> Alex, you had like really difficult cases, like somebody who has been in gears for a long time and. No, honestly, I'm thinking back. So I've had a lot of difficult cases, but it was never in correlation to their drug abuse from androgens. It was actually more their drug abuse from more recreational drugs. So oh, there was a lot yeah. of substance abuse, cocaine abuse that can destroy your spermatic production dramatically. And not only the production of what you're making now, but the future production. And that's whenever you can have birth defects and things like that. Was that marijuana? Smoking. No, smoking. Cigar. <laughs> not marijuana. Okay, yes. So, so if you are abusing any kind of smoking, cigar, cigarette, things like that, it does downregulate your overall sperm count, motility, and morphology. So you're kind of going back to shooting yourself in the foot if you're taking all these fertility drugs. It doesn't mean you can't get pregnant, but overall, it's not producing a uh, as viable of sperm as you could be producing. It's not the end all be all, but generally, if you're going to be trying, pull back on that. Okay, I see. Alex, before we end things. For how long you need to wait before after after using Nandrolone? It's very suppressive. Probably it takes longer time than the rest than DHT and the test derivative. Like for Nandrolone, I heard like one nanomole, it will make you suppressed, like MPP or a trend or whatever from taking 19 nors. So for how long you need to wait before starting a PCT for somebody who used 19 nor? So this goes back to the earlier conversation of if you talk to them and said you're planning on doing a PCT. Just yeah. don't shut down the factory in the first place. It's as simple as keeping HCG in the background because what did you say as well? People stop taking, let's say they're blasting gram and angel and whatever, and they want to stop and do their PCT, but they're waiting to see what happens with LSA, uh, LH and FSH. Those six or eight weeks they're waiting, they feel like dog crap. They're exactly, yeah. Time. Time. And that's having all these negative consequences from a health aspect. So you would be healthier to keep HCG in or to bring that in immediately. You're not waiting to clear the half-life because we're looking at duration of action, not drug half-life. There are non-genomic and genomic aspects to all drugs. So non-genomic meaning acute, genomic meaning chronic. So if we're looking at these androgens, there are acute and long-term based consequences, positive and negative to everything we're taking. So if we're looking at that change at the testicular level, that's non-genomic, that's immediate. So you can take ACG right afterwards and then the androgen is going to clear no problem but you really want to wait in the meantime and have a poor quality of life. Mm -hmm. If you want to wait and see if your natural production can go up, go crazy, but you might not be that person. You also may be that person. So it's more the personality of the person, but there's no problem with having ETG in the background. Can we do one more scenario before ending yeah, up? Yeah, of course. Yeah. One more scenario, um, Alex. Let's say somebody who's been doing PED for like one year now, and then he decided to stop doing PED for, for whatever reason now. And then, um, is it advisable to put him on TRT for some time, and while doing a TRT, we give him an HCG. Not to, not, I mean, the thing is, I don't want to, I don't want to keep him on zero testosterone, right? Put him, put him back down to TRT, and then start injecting him an HCG every other day, and then like after like two months, stop the testosterone and start a t uh, start a PCT protocol with him. What do you think about that? I love that. I've done that all the time, but it's ester dependent. 
So if we look at Sustanon, that was originally made for me veterinary medicine to drive up recovery very quick and then to taper down. It can do the same recovery from a testicular action side of things. So if we are trying to get immediate action, you bring in the Sustanon with the HCG for four weeks, eight weeks, something like that, slowly pull out. You don't even have to slowly taper the Sustanon because the doses won't be high. You, you can pull out immediately and it flows perfectly into that HCG intratesticular action of endogenous production kind of go. Okay. Sounds good. We have a lot of questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text you on Instagram more, no. Alex. <laughs> we, need, we need to get you, Alex. Alex, we need to get you to Dubai. You have to figure it out. I'll get, we'll get the whole family here if, the, if, if, if you really love to stay with them. Think about it. <laughs> I'll definitely be traveling in the future, but the future could literally mean 10 years, 20 years. Like, I have no idea. Because like, like I said before, with the kids right now, I, just, I don't want to miss a day with them. It's yeah. so much fun, you know? It's going to be even more fun in Dubai. Trust me. They'll have fun. Dubai is just amazing. Broderick, Broderick, Broderick they even thing. come to the Middle East never, but he's amazed with Dubai. You can ask John. He said that I should have stayed more. <laughs> I, I see all the pictures. It looks beautiful. You guys have access to everything, high quality, everything. Food, yeah. drugs, like it does sound like a beautiful place to be. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. You think about it, uh, Alex. We're more than happy to get you. I'll take it up with my wife. She'll smash sure, you. Sure, sure. Bring that so up. Sure, brother. For sure. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, we reached the, the end of the podcast. Thank you so much, Alex, for how... We can have another podcast, Yeah, actually, for sure, Alex. yeah. We, we, we'll Is talk okay? about it, yeah. Probably we'll talk about insulin, maybe, or something. Well, like yeah, that. I was going to talk about, about a lot of things, about insulin, yeah. and stuff like that. Even even if you feel like there's a certain subject you really love talking about, then we'll just get you in that. In that in We're that. the voice of the Middle East here. Yeah, kind of the voice <laughs> of the Middle East, yeah. Honestly, I'm fine with anything, man. I'll talk about any subject. If I don't know something, I'll say it, but... I don't need an outline before we talk. It's just conversation and it makes it a lot Sounds better. Great. Sounds sure. great. Thank Sounds you so good. much. Thanks, Alex. Alex. Thanks, Thanks a lot. And nice Thanks meeting you. Thanks for having me on, guys. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you.